So passion, passion for what you're doing. Now, let me just say, nothing happens without passion. And passion is something that drives someone. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that uh, Tom Brady is in the NFL. He's 45 years old. He's the oldest guy ever, and he may be the greatest ever, but you know why he's playing football? He's passionate about football. I mean, he's just passionate about football. And so when you find somebody passionate about things, they do great things. Uh, Bill Gates was, compa- was passionate about what? He, computers at one point. Now he's passionate about a world empire. But computers <laughs> is a starting point. How about Elon Musk? Would you say that guy's a passionate guy? Electricity, Tesla, and like that. And so what you find is people that are passionate are difference makers. And if you're not a passionate person, uh, get around some people. Let it become something that'll start in you because we need to get passionate about what we're doing. In fact, you know, it, really, it always bothers me because I've been watching the uh, NBA finals and last night uh, when the, 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 Ray, the, the uh, Lightning won the, the, the cup, Stanley Cup, and the people are crazy. Have you ever seen people at a, at a sports arena? They're crazy. I mean, they're just crazy. And they paint their face. And th- that's okay. That's normal at a hockey game. That's normal at a basketball game. That's normal at a baseball game because they're passionate. I'm waiting for the day when somebody comes in here to church with their face painted DC on either side. And <laughs> I'm, no, I'm not waiting for that because they wouldn't, they wouldn't say you're passionate. They'd say you're crazy. You know, you're a fanatic. Even, even when we worship, people think we're a little fanatical. But we love the Lord, and we're passionate about the Lord. And passionate people get things done. That's the point. They get things done. So we come to uh, Mark chapter 2 today, and I want to talk about uh, four guys who are passionate. And that moves Jesus to compassion. Beginning in verse 1 of uh, chapter 2 of the Gospel of Mark, uh, it, it says this, and, and he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Now, Capernaum, if you recall, was his headquarters. Of the 12 disciples, at least seven were around this area. We know Peter, they were in Peter's house, but Peter and Andrew lived there. Matthew was a tax collector there. Right across the way in Bethsaida was Philip and Bartholomew and James and John. So there's seven right there that, that, that are from right. This is their neighborhood. This is where they live. And the centurion built the, built the, uh, the, 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 the um, synagogue there, Jairus, where he was the, the pastor there. So we know a lot about this. More than, you, more than you think you know, you know. But stuff happened. Great things happened there because there were people who were moved and passionate about what they were doing. Verse, verse 2. And uh, immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them. Now, why were they there? They knew Jesus was there. Wherever Jesus is, he does something great. So they were, they were passionate. They, were, they wanted to get to Jesus. They couldn't even receive them, not even near the door. And so he preached the word to them. Verse 3. And then they came to him bringing the paralytic who was carried by four, four men And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they ripped off the roof. So it was when he'd broken through, they let him down on the bed in which the paralytic was lying. I want to say three things this morning. Number one, faith is something that is activated. It is something that is demonstrated. It is something, God will always give you something to do. You say, wait a second, wait a second. I thought we received everything by faith. And we do. Jesus did it all for us. But he wants us to learn to grow, and part of that is to, to activate, uh, activate our faith by cooperating with what the Spirit is saying here. In fact, when you book the book of Hebrews, you realize that Noah, by faith, built an ark. Was he ridiculed? Yes, he was. You know, he's out in the middle of the desert. There's no, nothing going on. Never had rain before. It's, he's, but by faith, he built the ark. Abraham offered Isaac by faith. Joshua walked around Jericho. The walls, seven times, by faith. Rahab hid the spies by faith. And what you discover is that faith is something that, that we have, but when you have it, it'll be evidenced in your life. It's, the basis of salvation is grace. 
But the proof of salvation is ministry. Let me say again. The basis of salvation is grace. By grace you're saved through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift of God. But if you have the grace of God working in your life, it'll be seen through your life by what you do. That's the whole thing with James and, and Paul. I, I believe we need to rest and relax and receive from the Lord. I mean, how much faith does a paralytic have? None. He's on the bed. But this is what, this is what they, these, these friends of his knew. That's why I said you need to get around passionate people. These friends knew if we could get him to Jesus, that Jesus would make a difference. And if you're here today and somebody dragged you or you're watching today with somebody and they drag you to watch, know this, the Lord has brought you to this place for a reason. There is nothing too difficult for the Lord. And what the Bible says is that the, the, the Israel limited the Holy One of Israel because they forgot his power. What can God do? Anything. As Jeremiah says, Lord God, you've created the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched your arm. There is nothing too hard for you. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. Say that out loud, would you please? There is nothing too hard for the Lord. And what the angels said to Mary, with God, nothing shall be impossible. So it's nothing impossible. So we're dealing in a realm now, and we're going to deal with this all summer long, the realm of faith where nothing is impossible. And so these guys come and they, 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 they rip off the roof. Can you imagine somebody ripped off the roof here? You know, but, but that's a demonstration of the faith that they had, that they would do anything. Reminds me of the email that somebody sent me. The FBI had a job opening, and the, the, the job was an assassin. So they were interviewing for, for an assassin, and after all the background checks, there were three finalists, two men and a woman. And for the final test, the FBI agents took one of the men to a large metal door and handed him a gun. We must know that you will follow instructions no matter what the circumstance. Inside the room, you'll find your wife sitting in a chair, Killer. The man said, you can't be serious. I could never shoot my wife. The agent said, you're not the right man for your wife, for the job. So he, he took his wife, went home. The second man was given the same instructions. He took the gun, went in the room. The room was quiet for about five minutes. He came out and said, with tears in his eyes, I tried, but I can't. I can't kill my, my wife. He said, you don't have what it takes. Move on. So he left with his wife. Finally, the woman came, and she was given the same instructions to kill her husband. She took the gun, went into the room. You know where this is going, don't you? <laughs> That's the good thing about a good, good email. You know where it's going. So she took the gun, went into the room. Shots were heard, one right after the other. They heard screaming, crashing, banging in the walls. After a few minutes, all was quiet. The door opened. Slowly there stood the woman, wiping sweat from her brow. This gun is loaded with blanks, she said. I had to beat him to death with the chair. <laughs> That's a joke. Don't write me emails. <laughs> the Lord will always give you something to do to cooperate with him. Not because he needs us, but we need him. And we need to learn to listen. And so these guys come and they can't get in. So what do they do? They rip off the roof. This is what I know. And I hope if you're here, you know this. If you're watching, I hope you learn this. Jesus will make a difference in your life. He loves you. He has limited, unlimited power, and he will help you no matter what your circumstance, no matter what your problem is. And so uh, they come to Jesus because whenever you come to Jesus, he'll make a difference. Somehow, some way, he'll make a difference. The second thing is that faith always gets challenged. And this is in verse, verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith. There again, you, you say faith is, is, is a noun. Well, it's a verb too. When they saw, when he saw them ripping off the roof and letting this guy down uh, through, the, through the ceiling, the paralytic, this is what he said. Son, your sins are forgiven you. Son, your sins are forgiven you. This created no small stir in that room uh, because some of the scribes were sitting there and they reasoned in their hearts why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned this in their hearts, he said, why do you reason these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. And I want to say a couple things about, uh, about the challenge of faith. First of all, they're challenging uh, uh, Jesus because they knew what it, co- what it cost for sin. Under the Old Testament process, if you sinned, you had to go to the priest and you had to tell him what, what you did. And then he would give you one of five offerings. You know, you got the burn offering, the trespass offering, the peace offering, uh, uh, the uh, uh, burnt and the grain. Did I, did I, whatever, look them up yourself. There's five of them. There's five of them there. There's the, there's the grain, there's the peace, there's the trespass, there's the sin. And w- whatever you did, they would give you an assignment. So sin was expensive. And by the way, it still is. Sin will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. And it'll keep you longer than you wanted to stay. That's what sin does. And so they knew the cost of sin. And so when Jesus said to this guy, uh, your sins are forgiven, they're, they're challenging this because they knew in the Old Testament that that would cost you, uh, could cost you a, a lamb or a bullock, or if, if you didn't have much, it could cost you uh, two turtle doves or grain, but it cost you something. It cost you something. So how can you, Jesus, say your sins are forgiven? And he tells us, so that you might know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sin. Who's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 that he died one time for all. So your sin is taken care of. The sin problem is taken care of. And you say, well, you know, I don't feel forgiven. And maybe you're here, maybe you're watching, and you don't feel forgiven. I don't care how you feel. I want to tell you what we know. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And this is the word of Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. This is what he's saying to the paralytic because that was the root of his problem. And I want to say to some of you today, all of you today, but some who are watching today, your sins are forgiven in Jesus' name. And you say, well, you don't know what sin I've done. I don't care what sin you've done. All sin. He died for all sin. There's no sin too deep. Nobody who's been in too long, he cannot forgive you. The problem is we don't believe, we don't act on that, and so we go by what we feel instead of by what we know. I can't tell you the number of people that I talk to uh, who say, well, Pastor, you know, I came to Christ and I prayed with you and all that, but I, I, I just don't feel forgiven. In fact, when I worship, my past comes up and the, 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 the horrible things that I did and the, the debauchery and stuff I was involved in, I just don't feel forgiven. And I said, I don't care how you feel. Let me tell you what I know. Your sins are forgiven in Jesus' name. So many people deal with guilt because they have never learned to overcome that guilt. Guilt is for something that I do. Shame is what I begin to take on in my character. That's who I think I am. You you are free from guilt And free from shame today in the name of Jesus. Be free in Jesus' name. I want you to walk out of here free, guilt-free, shame-free, your head lifted up because he has forgiven you. And he wants to do something miraculous in your life just like he did in this man's life. The root of his problem was a spiritual problem. Let me just say, this sin... Sin will cost you. It can debilitate you emotionally, relationally, physically, spiritually. It can cripple you in so many ways so you become ineffective. Primarily, the enemy wants to keep you from coming to Christ. But the next best thing is once you come to Christ to keep you debilitated by your own reminder of who you were and what you did. That's not who you are. You need to see who you are, and understand this, that God always comes to you from your future, not from your past. He says, I'll remember your sins no more. The problem is, you still bring them up. He comes to you from your future and says, this is what I have for you. God wants to make you your best you. And part of that is being free from 
the, sh the guilt and the shame that would paralyze me and cause me to cower back and say, I've got really nothing to offer. That is, that is a lie. You are free and you are forgiven in the name of Jesus. The basis of salvation is grace. But the proof of salvation is ministry, that you're doing something. Because the Lord loves you, you want to love people. And you display that love in a variety of ways, but it begins to get out there and, and, and talk to people. So, so uh, when they reasoning this in their heart, they, and he perceived in their spirit, why are you thinking like this? Why are you thinking like this? We think like this because we've been trained to, to, to walk in guilt and to walk in shame and to come every Sunday and kind of grovel a little bit. Be free. Amen. Let this thing be broken. And if you come here today with your head bowed or feeling defeated, listen, problems will not defeat you. Amen. How you view things defeats you. See things the way the Lord sees things. See other people the way the Lord sees people. See yourself the way the Lord sees you. How does he see you? Without spot or wrinkle. You say, well, I don't feel that way. That's because he's still ironing things out in your life. But that's who you are. That's who you are. You are forgiven and you are free. Turn to somebody and tell them, you are forgiven and you are free. The last thing is, Faith releases Holy Spirit power. Once he says that, notice what happens. But that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go your way to your house. Immediately he arose, took up his bed, went out in the presence of them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. The power of God is released in, with the presence of Jesus. And let me just say, if, if you have, Jesus is preaching a sermon in Peter's house. They rip off the roof. They bring this down. Jesus didn't say, you're ruining the roof. He's more concerned with people than anything else. We can always fix a, fix a roof. Always fix a roof. We can always clean the carpet. We can all... But it's amazing to me how many people get more concerned about stuff that doesn't matter and forget what does matter. What matters? People. Jesus loves people and died for people. And we can, we can always, we can always fix, fix the roofs. We can always get that done. And the second thing is, how do you handle distractions? Boom. Someone comes down. Illustrated sermon right there. Jesus says your sins are forgiven because he knew that was what was crippling the guy. Not, not just a physical condition, but I can tell you many physical conditions are caused because people don't let the Lord deal with this guilt and shame in their life. And so they're paralyzed by fear, by unbelief, by shame. And Jesus spoke that and the guy rose up and he walked in a different way. I want you to leave here today walking in a different way, free. Amen. If you came in discouraged and you say, well, you don't know my problem, you're not paralyzed, or maybe you are. Whatever your problem, this is what I know, don't limit the Holy One of Israel. He can do amazing things if you embrace that, believe that, and begin to declare that. Yeah. Something good is going to happen in your life. Say that out loud. Something good is going to happen in my life. Once again, something good is going to happen in my life. Faith releases the power of God, and then we need to just be responsive to what the Holy Spirit is telling us. What do you mean? Well, Mary's a teenager. You're going to be pregnant. How can that be? She listened to the Spirit of God, the nudges of God, and not to, not to her own rationale. Well, virgins can't get pregnant. But what can the Lord do? Anything. He can do anything. Then the nudge of Joseph. I want you to take your family. I want you to go to Egypt. See, the Holy Spirit nudges us 
to do things, to go places. And I want to say, nothing happens by accident. You've heard that said. Things don't happen by accident. People don't bump into your life by accident. That happens on purpose. And the, part of that is the Lord wants to use you in their life to make a difference in their life right then and right there. Those are Holy Spirit opportunities. When, when something you plan to do and something happens and there you are, it's, it's an intersection, it's intercession, it's a difference that you're making in someone's life. You say, well, who am I? You're a child of the king. And where you go, the king goes. Where the king is, there the kingdom is. Where the kingdom is, there is kingdom power. So stop and pray. I, I bumped into a guy this week, and, and, and he was having some problems in, in business. And I said, let's stop and pray right now. Okay. We prayed. We prayed right then and there. He came back the next day and said, God answered prayer. I had a deal go down that same day. It's been helpful. Last Sunday, we had uh, a lady here that uh, had a stroke. She was down for six hours, couldn't move. And uh, we went down to the hospital, couldn't get into the hospital. So we prayed outside. And then we got on uh, FaceTime and prayed over FaceTime. You know why? I believe there is no problem too hard for the Lord. And so we begin to activate the Lord to work by what we say and what we do and how we respond to it. It releases the power of God. What you say releases the power of God. And so you begin to activate that. Lord, I believe you. I know you can do this. And so this guy went out and, and was totally changed by the power of God. One episode, one day. And so I want to encourage you. If you're discouraged or defeated today, no longer. You are walking in victory in Jesus' name. If you came in here feeling, feeling discouraged, if you came in here feeling ashamed, no longer. You start to worship and you say, who are they? You say, if you're new here or you're watching for the first time, I just want you to say, at least they don't have their faces painted. <laughs> at least their faces are, you can watch it today, you can watch it tomorrow when the Celtics are on again and, and lose. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Being a Laker fan is really hard to support Boston, but uh, I'm not a Golden State fan either. I am. A, this is a no win. This is a no win deal here because I got two people mad at me already because of that. So the Lord will always give you something to do. When Jesus said to the ten lepers, "Go and walk. Go and show yourself to the priest," and it says this, and it was as they were on their way. They were healed. John chapter 9, the man who was born blind, he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is about a mile down. And it was as he went and washed, he was healed. It's as we listen and obey those nudgings, those promptings, those things in your heart that you think, I, don't, I can't explain this, but I just think we need to do this. Trust and obey. You can't always explain the Holy Spirit, but you need to obey the Holy Spirit and God will do amazing things in and through your life. Let's pray today, can we please? Father, we thank you for the work of your Spirit. We thank you that there is nothing, nothing too hard for you. And I pray for anybody who is discouraged today or came in here defeated, they would leave here with a sense of victory and the reality, Lord, that you call us more than conquerors. Not only do we win, we win triumphantly, and we win forever. So, Lord, whatever battle we're facing, we run to the battle, knowing that you have given us victory. Thank you, Lord, for transforming us. Thank you for people leaving here in peace. And if you're, if you're watching here today or you're here today and you don't have a sense of peace that is promised, I want to pray for you that your sins are forgiven, the shame is gone. What you did is forgiven how you feel about yourself is gone and you begin to feel different. In fact, you lift your hand there and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need, I need to leave here different, forgiven, and free. Yeah, way back. I see you. God bless you. Anybody else? You are forgiven in Jesus' name.
be free in Jesus' name. Yes, sir. Be forgiven and free in Jesus' name. Yes, ma'am. Be forgiven and free in Jesus' name. Yes, sir. Be forgiven and free. Yes, sir. Be forgiven and free. Yes, sir. Be forgiven and free. Yes. Be forgiven and free in Jesus' name. Yes, sir. Be forgiven and free in Jesus' name. I'll remember your sins no more. Choose to let those go. The Lord does. Choose to let them go right now. Let the peace of God that you can't explain rule in your heart and your mind. Don't let the enemy rob you of that joy of the Lord and peace of the Holy Spirit. We establish that presence and that work right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Seal these decisions up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's all stand together. Can we please?